Uh, there are a number of contrasts in Romans 8, and we'll see a few more of them uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, and um, I want to take you back to uh, 1974. I had recently graduated from um, undergraduate from university in mathematics, and I was heading to seminary. It wasn't quite clear at first where that would be, and it ended up at Reformed Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, but in 1974 and, and through into 1975, I lived with uh, a preacher, a mentor, uh, Jeffrey Thomas, uh, that some of you will know. And I lived in the manse with him and his wife and three children and a gerbil. <laughs> and uh, he decided, I was a young Christian, I'd, I had been saved in 1971, uh, so I had much to learn. And he decided that uh, we should get up together early in the morning, and, and, we're talk and I'm not an early morning person, uh, but we're talking 4.30, 5 o'clock, um, make very strong coffee, and um, we would read together uh, John Owen's Volume 7 uh, on the duties of spiritual mindedness. Uh, a lengthy treatise based on the section that we're going to look at tonight uh, in these verses from 5 through 11 of the 8th chapter of Romans. I, I still have that volume. I've taken it down many times since, and I've, I've reflected with some uh, sense of amusement uh, at the pencil um, notes that I wrote in the margin of the volume some of which are incomprehensible. <laughs> uh, and if, if John Owen's, John Owen, I think, thought in Latin and translated into English, which, which accounts for the prolixity of his uh, English style. Uh, and at 5.30 in the morning, it was incredibly difficult to make out what John Owen was actually saying, <laughs> except that he was urging with all of his might that we would grow in grace and that we would demonstrate as a consequence to our justification that we would demonstrate uh, in great quantities uh, a measure of sanctification that was in harmony with the desire and work of the Holy Spirit um, within us. And Dr. Charles has just referred to the fourth um, verse of chapter 8, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And evidentially here, speaking of something tangible that is worked out by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but equally along the lines of a New Testament exhortation that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and that what is before us now is sanctification, not simply definitive sanctification, not that we are sanctified in Christ Jesus, a wonderful New Testament truth, that we are saints already, but that we also have to demonstrably show a progressive holiness and a progressive sanctification that involves effort and repentance and change and fruit producing on our part. Well, let's read together um, Romans 8, picking it up now at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, 
It cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now, I want to see three things in this passage this evening, three statements that are true about every Christian. And the first is that the Christian is alive. Now, I don't mean, uh, I don't mean that he, has a, he or she has a pulse. I don't mean it in the soulish sense. And sometimes in the Bible, the word soul or spirit can simply refer to the fact that we that we are alive, that we are self-aware, that we have self-consciousness, that which continues to be after death, that we continue to be alive. We are, as Christians, in the presence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And what is it that is present with the Lord? Well, our very life is present. Our consciousness, our self-awareness is present. I don't mean that. I mean that the Christian is alive as opposed to being dead in trespasses and in sins. There are contrasts that Paul introduces here, the contrast between walking according to the flesh and walking according to the Spirit. There is a, there is a walk, a Christian walk, and it is a very different walk from the walk that is according to the flesh. Or Paul uses the contrast of living according to the flesh and living according to the Spirit. Or, as he also uses here, minding the things of the flesh and minding the things of the Spirit. One is a way of death, the other is a way of life. The natural man, and you see he refers to the natural man in verse 7, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So the natural man is dead in trespasses and in sins. His will is bound to his nature. He cannot serve God. Indeed, he cannot please God. And it takes supernatural, sovereign energy of God to bring that person out of a state of death and into a state of life. Think of the metaphors that the New Testament employs. The one in John chapter 3, where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. Unless a man is born again, or born from above. Unless a man has experienced that sovereign work of regeneration in his heart, in her heart, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, 3 and John 3, 5. He's speaking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the great Bible teacher. He's the one who knows the Scriptures inside out. He is, he is the preeminent conference speaker in Israel. And Jesus is saying something to him, and John, I think, wants you to understand this. He has great understanding. He has a profound understanding of Scripture, and Jesus is saying, 
Unless you are born from above, you cannot see, you cannot understand. And do you know what Nicodemus said? I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> Underlining the fact of his great need that he was a Bible teacher, but he wasn't regenerate. He was still dead in trespasses and in sins. We need a new birth. And uh, Paul here in Romans 8, when he's talking about the person who walks according to the Spirit or who minds the things of the Spirit or who lives according to the Spirit, he's saying, he's saying that, the, that this person is alive. Verse 6, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life. Think of another metaphor in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 5.21, if any man be in Christ. And, and in English, we, we provide a verb. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. But the verb doesn't exist in the Greek. If any man be in Christ, new creation. Something of the new creation, something of the new heavens and new earth, something of that order of existence that will be forever has perforated into the here and now. Something of the not yet has perforated into the here and now. A new creation. Every Christian is alive with a life that is a testimony to the life to come. That something of eternity has perforated into our life right now. We have, a, we have a glimpse of eternity. It has perforated into our very existence. Or think of the metaphor in Romans 6 and in verse 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Of course, he's mentioned uh, resurrection uh, in the very opening verses in reference to the fact that we've been baptized into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into His death. We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And the metaphor is resurrection. We have been born again, born from above. We have been regenerated. We are a new creation. We have been resurrected. We, we are in union with Christ and in union with His death and resurrection. So the Christian is alive. Sinclair Ferguson, who's been my friend for over 40 years, would often end his sermons. I had the privilege of uh, ministering alongside him uh, for two years at uh, First Presbyterian Church in Columbia. And uh, sometimes at the end of a sermon, he would say, isn't it a great thing to be alive? Isn't it a great thing to be spiritually alive? Isn't it a great thing to be a Christian? We are alive. We are not dead. We are alive with a life that will continue forever. Well, the second thing I want us to see is that the Christian lives for God by demonstrating what Paul calls here spiritual mindedness. It's a continuation of the fourth verse, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. It's what he refers to in verse 5 as living according to the Spirit. Or in verse 13, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Uh, 
What does he mean precisely here by engaging in spiritual mindedness? Well, I have a little test for you. Uh, roughly about the same time as I was reading John Owen in 1974, 75, I, I picked up, probably the year before, a little book, a little booklet by uh, John Stott. And I, I, I have a great affinity for John Stott. I was converted through reading his book, Basic Christianity. I owe my life, my spiritual life, uh, to him. I owe it to God primarily, but I owe, I owe it to John Stott instrument, instrumentally. And uh, John Stott wrote this little booklet. It was called, Your Mind Matters. Now, this was written in the 60s, late 60s, in a time mid-20th century when evangelicals, especially in Britain, more so in Britain than here in the United States, but evangelicals in Britain were deeply suspicious of how uh, seminaries and so on were, were, were teaching at a, at a very intellectual level. And uh, a strain, I think, uh, of, of pietism, uh, that what we needed was, uh, was something more, more spiritual rather than intellectual, and, and a, a somewhat of a false synthesis, I think, crept into evangelicalism in the mid-20th century in Britain between, between spirituality and, and intellectualism. And uh, so John Stott was addressing this, and addressing it in a, in a, in a way that this was for college students, uh, that was the audience, I think, that he was addressing. And he, he based it on Psalm 32, uh, be not like the uh, mule that needs to be driven by bit and bridle, but, but use your understanding, Psalm 32, use your understanding. And he, he sort of launched the book based on that text, to use your understanding matters. And he begins with a sentence, and I didn't check whether this was the actual first sentence, but it's, it's at the very beginning of this little booklet. The major secret of holy living lies in the dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blank. The major secret of holy living lies in the mind, was what he said. In the mind. Because he believed that what you think affects the way that you behave. Now, without um, going into... Um, faculty psychology and, and all of that mess, surely we can agree, we can agree that the way you think about something affects the way you do something. Your whole approach to life is governed by the presuppositions of the way that you think about something. We can use the term mindset to be spiritually minded. What is, what is this mindset? And there's a contrast here. There's, there's a mindset that minds the things of the flesh, and there's a mindset that minds the things of the Holy Spirit. Now, when he talks about flesh here in, uh, in verse 6, to set the mind on the flesh is death, he's using it in a different way. H.B. Uh, was saying uh, about uh, law, how Paul can use the word law in different ways, and I think he's using the word flesh uh, here. In a, in a, sometimes the word flesh in John, for example, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and verse 14, and, and the Word was made flesh. He's, he's not saying he was made sinful flesh. The, the whole point of uh, Romans 8 and verse 3 is, is to contradict that. But he was made flesh, flesh and blood. He was a human being. He wasn't an apparition. He wasn't a ghost. He didn't just seem to be a human being. He was, a, he was an actual human being. He had a, he had a belly button. He was, he was of Mary. There was an umbilical cord that tied him to his mother Mary. He looked like Mary. He never looked like Joseph. There would have been a time in his teenage years when he was in the carpenter shop before his, 
before Joseph died. And, uh, you know, the sun would be shining on him, and, and, and you'd look at him in profile, and you'd say to yourself, something about his jaw, uh, something about the color of his eyes, and you'd say, he looks just like Mary. And we've looked at children. People hand me babies all the time, and I, I never know what to say, because all babies look the same. But, <laughs> but when, they, when they grow up a little, they, they demonstrate, they, they reflect something of their parents. Sometimes I have two grandchildren. One is the spitting image of, of, of my daughter, and one is a spitting image of my son-in-law. It's uncanny. They're like, uh, they're like little clones of their parents, but different parents. Well, here, when Paul is using the word flesh, to mind, to set the mind on the flesh is death. To, to set your mind on that which the flesh, the sinful flesh, Adamic flesh, corrupted flesh, iniquitous flesh, flesh that isn't, that isn't born again, flesh that doesn't know anything about this resurrected life. It leads to death. So the natural man is the one who lives according to the flesh. Now, to be sure, the natural man has moments when he glimpses the transcendent. I listen to a lot of classical music, and sometimes I listen to it, and, and there'll, be, there'll be moments in the music of, of Gustav Mahler, for example. And uh, it doesn't matter if you don't know who that is. Um, but uh, these are symphonies that will last sometimes for an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half. These are, these are lengthy statements. And there'll be moments, sometimes typically in the slow movement. And, and the music is so exquisite. And you lose sense of time and space, and it's as if you're on, in another dimension. And, and the natural man, I, I don't know where Mahler was on the curve of religion, but he certainly wasn't a, an evangelical Christian by any uh, shape or means. But he glimpsed the, the transcendent. Yes, the natural man can sometimes, despite himself, what Paul says in the first chapter of Romans, that they, they not only can see the eternal power and Godhead of God, it gets through to them. It's not just something that's out there, objectively. It actually gets through. They actually get it, but they suppress it. They, they hold it down in unrighteousness. John Owen and I, I'm going back 45 years, but I, I remember vividly reading this, uh, this question in, in his treatise on the duty uh, of spiritual mind mindedness. He asked a question. What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything in particular? You know, so sometimes we're so fixated on what we're doing, our, our mind is going 100 miles an hour because we're, we, we're, we're on a project, we're on a mission. But uh, I'm talking about those times when you're sitting in the chair and daydreaming. You're not thinking about anything in particular. Where does your mind default? And John Owen said it's a great test of your spiritual mindedness. It's a great test of your spiritual maturity. It's a test as to how far you have grown in sanctification. It's terrifying, isn't it, when you think about it? Well, there's an advertisement. You may have seen this advertisement. And it's uh, an advertisement on behalf of a company that's um, teaching English to foreign students. And uh, they're in this sort of bunker, and uh, the instructor has come in to where this person is, and, um, and then leaves. He's given some instruction, he leaves the room, and uh, over the loudspeaker uh, comes a message, mayday, mayday, we're sinking. And uh, this happens two or three times, and the instructor doesn't come back, so 
he gets on a microphone and he says in, in very pronounced German uh, accent, uh, what are you thinking of? <laughs> well, it's the question that Paul is asking you here. What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Do you remember what John Calvin said in the Institutes? In uh, book 1, chapter 11 and verse, uh, section 8, that man's mind is a perpetual factory of idols. Factorum idolorum. A perpetual factory of idols. Now, he's, he's pre-industrial. But in our minds, we think of a, 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 a conveyor belt. And, and these people with, with almost mindless jobs, and, and the, the, they're producing these widgets, and they're just coming out one after another, and they're dropping into a basket, just one after another. And, and that's the image that Calvin has of our, our minds, the natural mind of the natural man. We, we are, it's a perpetual factory of idols. So, what does it mean to be spiritually minded? To to, and spiritual here with a capital S, to mind the things of the Spirit. What do you think the Spirit minds? Now, that would be a course, uh, to our course in seminary. That would be a, if uh, RC were here, it would be a 24-lecture series. What, do, what would the Holy Spirit mind? And um, I, I've only got a few minutes. Let's think about a few of them. Th things that are dear and close to the Holy Spirit. Scripture. Holy men of old wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All Scripture is breathed out, and, and the very language of, of theopneustos, it's the word spirit, wind and spirit, S similar connotations in Hebrew, similar connotations in Greek, that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. It blows, but you cannot, you cannot see it. All you, can, all you can know is its effects. All Scripture is the product of God, the Holy Spirit, breathing out. God breathes, and you've got Scripture. God speaks. What Scripture says, God says. All 66 books in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Three quarters of a million words in the original language, and it, it's a whole lot more when you begin to translate it into English. And every jot and tittle, the product of the Holy Spirit, the greatest gift that He ever gave us. I'm often ashamed. I have Bibles everywhere. I have two or three in my car or my truck. I can't tell you how many I've got at home, and I can't tell you how many I've got in the office. Multiple copies of the Word of God for which men like Thomas Cranmer gave their lives in the flames in order that you and I might have access to it in our common tongue. Your word have I hid in my heart. It is my meditation day and night. You want to be spiritually minded? Well, Paul is saying you don't, you don't close your eyes and hum. That, that, that's not spiritual minded. The spiritual mindedness is to dig deep into the Word of God, to learn it, to treasure it, to memorize it, to make it your, your meat and drink, your, your, 
your hourly, minute by minute, second by second nourishment to grow in grace. Do you remember what Jesus said in the upper room? I will go away, but I will come to you again. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. What is the great ministry of the paraclete, the other comforter, the other helper? It is, it is to make Christ known to you and me. He is the personal representative agent of the Lord Jesus. Now that Jesus in His incarnate body is in heaven, He is in another realm. He is in a parallel universe to this one. He has crossed through the veil to a place that we call heaven. And there He is physically in space and time. And He cannot be in two places at one time. His human body does not possess the attribute of ubiquity. But instead, He sends His Spirit, His personal representative agent, the one with whom, as the Son of God, He has been in communion with for all eternity. He makes Jesus special to you. You know, our church building, it's 225 years old, and uh, well, the building isn't, but the church is 225 years old, and it's a magnificent Gothic, R.C. would have loved it. It's a Gothic design, and uh, pink, sort of, reddish pink color. Um, and at night, uh, there are spotlights. They're disguised, they're in little bushes, they're behind little constructions so that you, when you're walking along the street, you can't actually see the light. All you can see is the beautiful building. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't draw attention to Himself. That's not His business. His business is always to reflect the refulgence of the glory of the Lord Jesus. He wants you and I to have a big and majestic view of the Lord Jesus. What does it mean to be spiritually minded? Surely it means to have holy thoughts, sanctified thoughts. And that's what this passage is largely about. It's emphasizing the role of progressive sanctification and how that sanctification, how that, that separatedness manifests itself in the realm of our thinking, of our minds, of our meditation, of our aspiration. So, the first thing I wanted us to see was that the Christian is alive. The second thing was that the Christian lives for God by demonstrating spiritual mindedness. And then the third thing is that the Christian is going to be brought um, all the way home. You notice as he brings this little section to a close in verse 11, it actually continues in the verses that follow, uh, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Let's pause there for a second. The, the Holy Spirit, this is the Spirit of Christ. And, and elsewhere, uh, he refers to, in verse 9, for example, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, capital S, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit who indwelt Christ. Who knows Jesus best? Who knows Jesus best? The Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit who indwelt Jesus in the womb as a little toddler, as a, as a teenager, at the beginning and onset of His ministry, in, as He walked into temptation and trial, as He faced 
enemies and difficulties as he faced the enduring penalty of the cross. It was by the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit dwells in you. There's not a trial, there's not a circumstance that Jesus has not walked through before. We do not have a high priest who cannot be tempted with, uh, who cannot be, uh, he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. When we find ourselves in trial, the, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Spirit who in the next section in verse 15 witnesses with our spirits that we are the children of God. We do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, the witness of the Holy Spirit. And this witnessing ministry of the Holy Spirit, telling us and reminding us of our identity in Jesus Christ, but also reminding us and bringing to our attention the Lord Jesus. You may be in the very depths of the darkness of a dungeon where giant despair lives. And when the lights go out and you fall to the ground and, and in the darkness you feel a footprint, it is the footprint of the Lord Jesus who has gone before you. Because there is not a trial, there is not a circumstance that He hasn't walked through. And it is the Spirit's testimony to witness to us the word cry in verse 15 is the word that is used in the Gospels when Jesus cried out on the cross, meaning, I think, that Paul is saying that the most endearing times to be reminded of our adoption into the household and family of God, the most, the most eloquent moments when the Spirit's testimony as to our identity as the adopted children of God is actually when we are at our lowest point, when all we can do is cry, and the Spirit, the Spirit comes, and He reminds us of who we are by drawing us to embrace once again the beauty and the loveliness and the attractiveness of the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit in us, Christ in us by the Holy Spirit. Some years ago, uh, we have one of these urns. It's a, it's this tall it's Mexican. I don't think it was made in Mexico, but it was, it's, it's Mexican in its appearance. It sits outside our front door. And uh, I noticed one day a little bird. It was a blue swift. And uh, I noticed it going into the urn. And uh, I, I went out the front door and uh, looked inside, and there were six little eggs. And I felt uh, deeply honored. I'm a sentimental kind of person, and um, I thought, what, a, what an honor, what a blessing that this little bird has, has made a home in our home and made a family in our home. Our cat wasn't best pleased, but, <laughs> but I watched these eggs hatch, and I watched this mother bring all kinds of food for these little chicks, and one day I looked in the urn, and, and they were gone. Uh, she made a home in our home, and, and that's the picture here, that, that Christ makes a home in us by His representative agent, the Holy Spirit. 
and part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not only to urge us to think holy thoughts, to, to mortify unholy thoughts, to be spiritually minded, in other words, but also to remind us of the very character of the redemptive purposes that are at work here. Because when God saves us, He doesn't do so piecemeal, and He doesn't do so half-heartedly, but He does so with a view to the grand finale of this redemptive purpose that we will see in the very final message of our weekend tomorrow that I think that, that uh, Steve Lawson, Dr. Lawson will be addressing. And that, that marvelous peroration uh, in verses uh, 31 and 32, what then shall we say to these things if God be for us, who can be against us? And earlier in verse 29, that those whom He foreknew He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Well, that's what He's saying here in verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he knows how to raise people from the dead. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. He goes, as it were, from this world to the next. He goes from the, the now, and the now is trial, and the now is temptation, and the now is a battle, and the now is a fight, and the now is, is mortal combat with our, with our enemy who prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But, but he's saying, don't take your eyes off the goal. He's going to bring you all the way home, because having begun a good work, he will add all the finishing touches to bring you home safely to a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, let me leave you once again with that question of John Owens in his seventh volume. What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything in particular? And let that be, as it were, the impulse that we would use our time wisely, that we would redeem the time by developing and encouraging what Paul calls a spiritual mindedness, a mind that minds the things of the Spirit. Father, we thank You. Thank You for the joy of what it means to be a Christian, despite, despite the difficulty, despite the lack of progress that sometimes we discern, despite the evident echo of Paul in Romans 7, that the good that we would, we do not, and the evil that we would not, that we find we do, O wretched man uh, that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And we know the answer, that you will Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Your magnificent and effectual redemptive purposes in our lives, having begun, You will complete. Help us, Lord, this weekend to remember that, for Jesus' sake. Amen.